Turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 1, please. Scripture reading this morning will be Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy, and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are from before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the, uh, and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, because the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet, saying, Write in a book what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamum, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. This morning we're going to be talking about the message to the seven churches found in Revelation chapter 1 through chapter 3. I read chapter 1 because it provides a nice introduction to the material I'm assuming that you might have some familiarity with this, but if not, I, I do encourage you to follow along in your Bibles and perhaps read this uh, afterwards. I'm going to try to record this lesson and put it on our website as well for review. And originally, I intended to go through all the seven messages in one lesson. And after I finished, I had over 50 slides, and my wife suggested, maybe you should break this up into multiple lessons, and I agreed. Uh, I didn't want to go too fast through all of these seven messages. What I'd like to do is, by way of introduction is let you know that the book of Revelation, while there's much language and you read it and it's like, wow, all this grand scenes that are being displayed and sometimes it's scary. Many movies and stuff are made, you know, scary stuff from Revelation. But the book is a book of encouragement. Now encouragement in two ways. It encourages the faithful to hold fast and endure the trials that they're enduring and that they're currently enduring and the ones that are shortly going to come but also it encourages those who are in sin to repent before an impending judgment. So sometimes encouragement is, is two-pronged. It can encourage those who are doing right, and those who are doing wrong, they need encouragement too to do the right thing. I want to point out that this is the revelation of Christ. Uh, many people call it the book of Revelations and put an S on it, but if you notice carefully in your Bible, it's just the revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And notice in, in, in verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, 
Jesus got it from God. So it, the, here's the chain that it, that where this revelation came from. It's all in, there's a lot of information just in verse 1. God gave it to Jesus, who gave it to his angel, who gave it to John, and it was intended for the Lord's bond servants. Um, so you see that in verse 1. Also in Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, it says things which, which must soon take place. There's an immediacy to this message. And in, in chapter 1, verse 3, those who read it and hear it are to be blessed. Uh, more specifically, those who actually heed the warnings and heed the things that are in the messages to the seven churches. Now, I'm not going to talk that much about uh, the seven churches themselves in terms of whether or not they're literal or figurative, but we could discuss that later if you like. In any case, I think that these messages are just as applicable to churches today as they were when this was written. There are some things here that I think that you should notice in chapter 1 regarding the descriptions of Jesus Christ, the descriptions of the one who is giving the message. And the reason that I point these out is because these descriptions are going to become very important as we look at each message to the individual churches. These characteristics of Christ are going to be used to different churches, and the promise to those who overcome, as we see in a moment, is going to come to light. They're all going to come back to these unique qualifications of Christ and his ability to command the church. And Revel I hope that makes sense, but if not, it'll make sense as we go along. In Revelation 1, 5, he's called the faithful witness. He is the firstborn of the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the one that is among or amidst the lampstands. He is the one who has eyes of flaming fire. And his feet are like burnished bronze. And you may think, why is that significant? We'll see that as he looked at the message to the churches. Furthermore, it's in his right hand that he holds these seven stars. And out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, and his face is like the shining of the sun in its full strength. He is the first and the last, and he is the living one, the one that was dead and the one that came back to life again and is going to be alive forever. And furthermore, he is the one that has the keys to both death and Hades. Now, why do I emphasize these? Again, as we look into the, into the messages to the churches, it's going to become apparent that these qualifications are going to be repeated uh, throughout the messages. The, message, the, the letters to each church, or the message to each church, follows a format that I'm presenting here. It's not always clear when you're looking at your modern translation, but each message starts with, thus says the insert the description that, I'm, that we're going to talk about. I just gave you all those descriptions before, but each message starts with, thus says the, and he gives his qualification. Thus says the one who is alive, you know, from the dead. Or thus says the one who has the keys to the kingdom. So the, the Greek there is tade lege ho, you know, th thus says the, the one who has the authority to tell you this. Not, not, not always clear, the, the modern translations don't actually hold that format the beginning of each one. Next he says what he knows. I know, and he sees what's going on. Sometimes this is praise, sometimes it's not, but many times he's praising them at least for some things that they're doing right. But he has something against them. Not in every case, but in many cases he has something against them. He's indicating a problem that he knows about that they need to repent of. And then at the end he gives a promise to him who overcomes and you'll see that in all the letters, to him who overcomes, Christ promises a very special blessing, and this special blessing ties back to, to his qualification, the one who said this, and, and the qualification is ties back to him who overcomes. If you've not noticed that before, I encourage you to look at that deeply as we go through this, and perhaps after, after our session today. And then at the end of every message, he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the angels said, well, basically what, what's being said to the churches. So there's seven different uh, messages to seven different churches. We're not going to go through all of them today. We're going to go for, through the first three. So to the church in Ephesus, 
Thus says the, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks uh, in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now, this is starting in chapter 2, but we learn what these seven stars are. We learn what these lampstands are in chapter 1, verse 20. He tells us very plainly. He says the seven stars are the seven angels. There's one angel or messenger for each church. Now, there's some controversy over what these are, but, it, but whatever it is, either could be a messenger, you know, relaying stuff back and forth to the churches. It could be uh, the presence of an angel, you know, representing God's presence among them. I'm not really sure. We could talk about that later. But what, we, what is clear is that the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And he says that. Now, Christ is walking among the seven churches. His presence is among them. That is the one who's addressing them. He says also the one who has the seven stars in his hand. He, in his hand, has the messengers. He has authority and control over the messengers of the angels of these churches. So he can hold them back and he can release them. Uh, furthermore, he sees everything and knows what is going on because he is the one who walks among them. You can't fool him because he knows everything that is going on. Now furthermore, in Revelation 2, 2 and 3, he says what he knows. I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. So they're praised for doing some things right. Specifically, they have no tolerance for evil. They don't tolerate it. They don't put up with it. They've tested and condemned false teachers, false prophets among them. Uh, and notice uh, their diligence in doing this. They showed perseverance and endurance while they were doing this. So they didn't give up trying. They, they, they had no tolerance for the evil. And they stood against them. They tested and condemned the false teachers. But if you notice down in verse 4, Christ still has something against them. Now, many churches would think if they're doing all these things, they're, they're good. Christ would be pleased. But Christ still has something against them. He says in verse 4, But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I'm coming to you, and I'll remove your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. Now, what is the lampstand? It's the church. Christ will come, and if, if you don't repent of these things, I'll just take it away. Make it dry up. Make the church go away. So Christ is not pleased because they've slacked off. That's how I interpret this. They've stopped their former deeds. You know, you see this a lot, um, you know, when teenagers have their first boyfriend or girlfriend. At first, you know, it's really intense, you know, your first love. And then after a while, it's just, eh, you know, new, new, somebody new, somebody new, somebody new. Well, Often, when we come to Christ, we're on fire for the Lord. We're on fire to serve Him. We're doing the things that He wants us to do. But isn't it possible for us to leave our first love, to, to neglect Him, to stop doing the deeds that we did in the beginning? I think it's connected to the fact that we often forget who is walking among the lampstands. It's Christ's presence among us that is sustaining us, that is holding us up, that is keeping us um, as a church and keeping us individually. So what we need to be doing and what they were called to do is they were called to repent or they would be completely cut off from Christ. So it wasn't that they just had the teaching and they had no tolerance for false teaching. They weren't doing the teaching, you see. They weren't implementing the things. They had become slack in their implementation of the things that God wanted them to do. But he gives a promise in chapter 2, verse 7. He says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, how does all this connect? Well, I hope that we can connect it. A promise to the individuals who overcome. Now, you remember back in Genesis that man and woman were separated from the tree, the tree of life, in the Garden of Eden. They were cast out of the garden, right? Well, Christ is promising a reunion with a tree of life in paradise with God. Now Eden and paradise uh, connected there, right? So if you think about it, hasn't man always been trying to get back to God 
ever since he was kicked out of the garden. You know, we had access to that tree of life. We could eat from that tree of life and live forever. And ever since, you know, we're, we're trying to get back to God. Well, Christ is that tree of life in this analogy. But where is he? He's in heaven. So, in order to be with him, to eat of that tree of life, which is Christ, we have to be in heaven also. So, a source of sustenance that cannot be taken away, but it's in heaven. So, once we eat in, in heaven, because the tree was in the garden, and Christ's sustenance is in heaven, so why would we forsake the tree that is giving us life? Why would we forsake our first love if he's the, the, you know, the thing that's sustaining us? Why would we grow cold and stop doing the deeds that would please him? So, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And here's some questions for us. Have we left our first love and stopped doing uh, the former deeds, the deeds that we did when we were in love with Christ, on fire for the Lord? Have we forgotten that it's Christ's presence that is among us and that it can also be removed uh, as a church, that our church would not exist without the presence of Christ? Uh, are we striving to get to the tree of life? Or are we just, you know, going through the motions? Here's some things for us to think about. Now, the second message is to the church in Smyrna. Thus says who? The first and the last, who was dead and has come to life. That is who is addressing the church. What's interesting about this statement is this equates Christ with God. If you look back in, in, in chapter 1... Um, it's very interesting here that it seems to me to be talking about God and then it's talking about Christ as well. Uh, verse 8 is, says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. Um, I, I had a, a sheet here somewhere that I was going to have had some notes on, but no matter. Uh, I'm, I want you to look very closely at chapter 1. And you'll notice who is actually delivering this message. It shows that God is delivering this message, that Christ is delivering this message, that the Spirit uh, of God is delivering this message, and so all three are uniquely defined. Uh, and God is the one that's uniquely defined as the first and the last in chapter 1. But in chapter 2, Christ is the one delivering this message, in effect equating himself with God. And, and also, it doesn't just stop there. He says in Revelation uh, 1.5 that he's the firstborn of the dead. And here he says that he was dead and has come to life. He's the first one that has that authority. He's uniquely qualified to conquer death. No one else can do that. And so this is the one who's delivering this message. That's what I want to impress upon you. This is the one who knows something about this church. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison, so that you'll be tested, and you'll have tribulation for ten days. Prove yourself faithful unto death, and you will and you will and I will give you, sorry, the crown of life. Christ here is fully aware of their hardships. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. You think you're poor, but you're really rich. <laughs> he thinks that they need to realize, and what they need to do is they need to realize where their true source of wealth is. It's not in their physical possessions. It is the fact that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He encourages them, furthermore, don't fear the suffering that is before you because it's not going to last forever. In fact, what they're going through is a testing that's by the devil but he t says it's not going to last but a limited time. He says here, literally, he says tw 10 days. Now, if proven faithful, Christ is going to promise them something, and that is going to be the crown of life. He is the one, remember, he's the one addressing the church, the one who is the firstborn of the dead, the one who has the power to give life, and so he is uniquely qualified to give anyone a crown of life. Does that make sense? Because he's the one that's conquered death. And if he's done that for himself, he can do that for others. I want you to take special note that there's no but I have this against you section in Christ's message to Smyrna. He seems to be pretty pleased with them. However, they need to continue, continue to endure the hardship and the testing that's before them. 
Now, what he promises them in Revelation 2.11, he says, To the one who overcomes, they will not be hurt by the second death. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the second death? Well, if we can skip ahead a little bit, Revelation 20, Revelation 20 verse 14 says that the lake of fire is the second death. And I think this is um, not good, right? Um, and we could talk more about that later, but I think this is the whole idea here is, is, is that the one who overcomes, like he promised the other church, they're going to have access to the tree of life. They're, he's going to grant them a crown of life. Now, if I, if I give you a crown of gold, I'm telling you something about the crown. It's made of gold. If I give you a crown of life, I'm telling you something about the crown. It is the one that, that gives you life. And so he is telling them that they're not going to be hurt by the second death because they're going to have this crown of life that, and the, that will help them, will protect them from being protected by it. You see, the, the fact that they have this, they're not going to be uh, enduring the lake of fire. And Revelation 2 and verse 10 uh, they'll be given a crown of life instead. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, here's some questions for us. When things aren't going right, when we think that we're enduring all this hardship and, and we don't have the things that we need, do we forget our true source of wealth? Do we, do we forget to place our priority on our wealth in relationship with Christ rather than the material things that we have? Perhaps some of you are faithful, but you fear the suffering that you're enduring or going to endure. Christ is saying, don't fear that suffering, because it's not going to last forever. In fact, it's a test. The devil is testing you, but Christ is going to limit the duration of that testing. Which I will say here, God promises that Satan's testing won't last forever. His encouragement is, just remain faithful. If you're faithful... Just remain faithful. You don't have to fear suffering. Keep your eye on the fact that it's not going to last forever. And keep your eye on the fact that Christ is going to promise each and every one of us, if we're faithful, a crown of life. Let's look to the message uh, given to the church at Pergamum. The message to the, per the church in Pergamum, chapter 2 and verse 12. Thus says who? Who's saying this? It's the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. So how does this apply? Well, Christ's sword represents his power to fight and win over his enemies. It's his ability to make war on his enemies. We learn, it's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 16. He's the one who has this, and I pointed that out in the introduction. This powerful sword is his word. It comes out of his mouth. Uh, I think it's furthermore interesting that he only has to speak to win over his enemies. He doesn't have to actually lift a finger. It's his words that have power. And furthermore, it's his word that will judge. The same word that will break, make war on some people will be the same uh, word that will actually deliver others. So it's dual-natured. Two-edge, it, it, it's dual-natured. John chapter 12, verse 48, Christ says directly that it's his word that's going to judge them in the end. Interesting, John writes both the Revelation here and he writes the Gospel of John. So what does he know? What does the one who has the two-edged sword know about the church in Pergamum? He says, I know where you dwell. Meaning, you know, some, we might say, I know where you live. That idea, you know, he has familiarity. He wa he's the one who walks among the churches. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast my name. And did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my witness. My faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Christ seems to know that the, the church there is like a hotbed for Satan's influence. In fact, so much so that uh, one of the faithful Christians there <coughs> was killed for the sake of righteousness, and in spite of that, the others still remain faithful. So Christ seems to be impressed with the fact that they are, even though they're in this hotbed of Satan's influence, they're still uh, faithful amidst that persecution. He wants them to continue to hold fast and be faithful under this threat of death. And I wonder oftentimes if somebody came in and started, you know, dragging us out into the street and, and killing us, you know, would everybody be faithful? You know, would everybody continue to do or would people like start shying away? I'm very impressed with the church in Pergamum and what's being said here about the church. Some of them were killed. At least one guy was killed for doing what's right. He's a faithful witness. 
and yet they still are not denying the faith. But, you'd think that would be enough to do. Christ is still not completely pleased with this church. He says, but I have a few things against you. Why? Because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam. Now, this is a reference back to the Old Testament, Numbers chapter 22 through maybe 31 or so, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they were delivered out of slavery in Egypt, they wandered through the wilderness, and they were on their way to the Promised Land. They met some opposition, and there was a guy named Balak who was in opposition to the Jews, and he hired uh, a prophet to, uh, of God to prophesy against the nation of Israel. And in, in the beginning, he started out good, didn't he? But at, at there towards the end, he started doing what, basically preaching for money and, and doing whatever uh, he needed to say in order to win influence uh, with the people who were paying him. So this is what it's saying. There's some people there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, to eat some things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of adultery. I, I, acts, of, acts of immorality, excuse me. Now, whether this is figurative or literal, that's a good question. We could talk about that. But I, I am more leaning to the, to the way that this is not, he's not saying that these people are teaching the same thing that Balaam was teaching. I think he's saying they're doing the same thing that Balaam was doing by, by, by being willing to corrupt uh, sound doctrine. He says, so you also, meaning he's comparing the two, I believe, so you also have some in the same way who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Again, we see the sword of his mouth, the two-edged sword, is the thing that's going to make war. And that's because some are willing to compromise doctrine like Balaam. Balaam is mentioned not just in Numbers 22. He's also mentioned, again, as someone who's willing to compromise doctrine in 2 Peter 2.15 and Jude 1.11. So the, new, what I, the reason I point this out is because the New Testament use of Balaam is always used in a bad light as someone who compromises teaching. <laughs> Furthermore, these things put stumbling blocks in other people's way. When we're willing to compromise the teaching of God, it causes other people to sin. It causes other people to stumble. And I don't know if you remember what happened at the end to Balaam. Balaam was killed by the sword. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence because here in this passage, those who do not follow the teaching of God are going to be killed by the sword of his mouth. And so there's a comparison there that's further being made. Well, if, you, if you're familiar with this story, and I believe that, that this letter of Revelation is written to people that assumes that they're familiar with the Old Testament. So if you read the book of Revelation and you're lost, it's because you don't understand the Old Testament good enough. And I'm including myself there. You know, when I read the book of Revelation and I get confused, it's because I don't understand the Old Testament like I should. The, the revelation means something to be revealed, right? <laughs> so it's being revealed to people who should understand it. Now, furthermore, Christ calls them to repent or face a quick judgment. A in fact, in Revelation 1-7, 1, 1, he says it's the one, like coming on the clouds. This, this idea of, of, of quickly coming like a thunderstorm just out of nowhere just appears on the scene. But to him who overcomes, this is the promise, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. Uh, again, a reference back to that point in history where they were coming through the wilderness. And I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one, else, which no one knows but he who receives it. Again, some very strange language here. But this is what I think he means. He says, the one who, basically implying the one who is able to make war is also able to give life and he's promising manna. What was manna? It was the sustenance for the children of Israel when they're wandering through the desert. It was the bread from heaven that, that every morning they got up and it was, it was there. And they, they gathered it and they made bread from it. They didn't have to work for it. It sustained them. So Christ is promising bread of life to those who overcome these challenges, these temptations, the ones who will repent of these teachings, the one who will hold fast to the end, even though they're in the den of Satan. And John 6 26 through 58, again, Gospel of John, also written by John, the same John who wrote Revelation, indicates here in chapter 6 that Christ is that manna. He quotes Christ as saying that. He, he is the bread from heaven in that dialogue with the Jews when they were confused over, over what he meant. 
the Jews were saying, hey, Moses fed us man in the wilderness. And he said, you don't understand, I am the bread from heaven that gives life. And they will be given a new name by Christ. To understand this reference, I think you have to go back to Isaiah chapter 62 and Isaiah 65 about this prophecy of what would happen in the, in the future under the new covenant. But it's this idea that the reputation of the people in Isaiah 62 and Isaiah 65 was they had the reputation of a woman who had been divorced from, had been put away from, uh, a bad reputation. You know, in the old days, if you did not have a husband, how would you be sustained? What would be your livelihood? And the reference here in Isaiah 62, 2 through 5, is God's promise that in the future, he's going to give his people a new name. And instead of become, being called forsaken, they'll be called married. They'll be called by his name. In fact, when Fiona married me, she took my name. You see? She was called by a new name. And so we, ideally... You could say we're married to Christ now, but perhaps a better way to look at it is maybe we're betrothed to Christ and we're waiting for him to go and prepare a place for us and to come back and, and, and to live with him forever, you know, uh, where we would never, never be uh, divorced from him. So we will be given a new name, um, and we can talk about that um, later if you want. So he who has an ear to hear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's the point. We cannot be blind to Satan's influence in the church. Christ knows the influence, and we have to be on watch for it as well. We have to ask ourselves, would we be willing to compromise sound teaching and by, and, and by implication there cause other people to stumble? Would we be willing, under Satan's influence, to just go along to get along and compromise some things? Christ would not be pleased with that. We have to remember that Christ's judgment will come swiftly for those who don't repent of the false teachings or those who actually cause stumbling blocks to others. Now, next week, we're going to look at the message to these four other churches, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. But in closing, I want you to remember the format of these letters. Thus says the Lord. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and it is his message to the churches. We need to look and think about very carefully the unique qualifications that are mentioned, not just in chapter 1, but at the beginning of each of these letters. This shows that he has full control and authority to command the church and command us. It was mentioned here, uh, Christ's authority in our Bible class this morning. That means that we must be willing to submit to his rule. We need to realize that Christ knows things about every one of these churches, and he knows what is going on in this church as well. You can't hide it. You can't fool it. Even if we act like the, uh, a problem doesn't exist, Christ still knows that a problem would exist. And he gives us, the but is, he gives us an opportunity to repent individually or congregationally before he will bring judgment. But he does promise that he will bring judgment. But to him who overcomes, he's going to give great blessing. He promises special blessings to those who will repent and those who remain faithful. And he closes each one again by he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. This implies that not everyone is going to hear this, but those who have an ear to hear it will hear it, and they will heed it, and they will do what is necessary either to remain faithful or to repent so that they can get the blessing and not incur the coming judgment. As our custom um, in our worship services on Sunday morning is that we provide a, an invitation for those who have not obeyed the gospel of Christ. Now, this has not been a, uh, this has been more of a textual uh, analysis of Revelation 1 through 3. This has not been a gospel sermon, but there may be somebody here who does not have a relationship with God and is here this morning because they want a closer relationship with God. <coughs> if you feel that you are not right with the Lord, then you have a problem. If you feel that you have unforgiven sins and you don't feel like if you died today that you'd be in heaven, you have a problem. But the good news is Christ is willing to solve that problem. 
What he requires of you is to believe that he is the only way and only path to get to heaven. That he is the son of God, equal to God, came and lowered himself from a God status to the status of a man, willing to walk beside us and do everything that he's not asking us to do anything that he hasn't done. And he was able to do it flawlessly. Because we've sinned, he, he gave up his flawless life as an atonement and a replacement sacrifice for us. We sin, we deserve to die. We deserve to go to hell. That's step one. You need to realize that. That none of us, God doesn't des- owe uh, any of us anything. We sin, and, and God is righteous, and he says, you, you know, if you don't do what I say, then, then that's the punishment. But because of God's grace, and because of his love, he extended his son to die in our place. Now, if we want to have forgiveness of our sins and be right with God again, have peace with God instead of his wrath towards us, we have to believe in that sacrifice, believe in his son. We have to repent, which doesn't mean just saying I'm sorry. It means turning from my sin and walking in a new direction, walking in the ways of the Lord and in the ways of Christ, the teachings of Christ, being obedient to him, asking him to forgive us of our sins, and being baptized into Christ, which is dying to the old self. You know, Romans 6 talks about water baptism uh, emulating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's a burial in the water, and it's a coming up out of the water again, just like Christ was put in the ground for three days and then rose again on the third day. And then in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, in the Great Commission, Jesus says, go into all the world and, and, and teach people, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And not just that, teaching them to observe all that I commanded. So some people just want to come to Christ and get forgiven, and then they go away and they never actually obey Christ. They never actually become righteous and holy, uh, the holy person they need to be in order to inherit heaven one day. So wherever you are uh, along that spiritual journey, if you need to get into Christ through baptism, or if you're already in Christ, but you've forsaken him for some way and you need to repent, then we offer that invitation this morning. If you're not sure what you need to do, but you know you're not right with Christ, then please find somebody you can talk to so that we can get these questions answered, not from our opinions, but from the word of God itself. We make that invitation known to everyone. If you have a need, we ask you to come and make that known as we stand and as we sing.